and welcome to the next in the series of the Mackerel Solicitors 2021 webinars. I am Alison Green, a partner and head of the family and relationship team here. I'm joined today by Jim Richards of my team, and we are also delighted to welcome Christopher Lee from Dominic Adebrados in Spain. Today we will be discussing differences in family and relationship law across the two jurisdictions of England and Wales and Spain. It's obviously not uncommon for clients of other types of jurisdictions when it comes to dealing with the legalities of relationship breakdown. However, the results of one jurisdiction over another can be dramatically different. And we hope in this webinar to explore the potential benefits and also the pitfalls of each jurisdiction and the differences in law and procedure, which as you will see are very, very different. At the end of the webinar, there'll be the opportunity to ask questions. So please do put any questions you may have in the Q&A box and we'll endeavour to deal with those at the end. I'll move to the next slide, please. So we're going to start with child arrangements and Jim is going to talk us through how that works under English law. Okay, so um, <clears throat> English law, uh, main focus is on the, the children, not on the parents. Um, and the way that um, the legal system in this country approaches uh, making any kind of um, arrangement which is in any sense legally binding uh, is to consider what we call the welfare checklist and the welfare checklist contains um, a specific list of factors which are bound to be taken into account by anyone who's involving themselves in anything which could be considered to be um, a legal arrangement. Now to some extent parents can do what they like um, they can mean any kind of arrangement between uh, themselves, which is practical and which works. Um, but if you want to take that a step further and have something which is either ratified by a judge or uh, if there's a dispute between the parents, one says that a certain thing should occur, whether it be a school or um, you know, a particular uh, issue in terms of spending time with parents or even more fundamentally where they should live which parent they should spend time with then the resolution of that issue has to be uh, or is done um, with reference to the welfare checklist and there are certain presumptions that we have in the the checklist which um, I think the most important for a parent to understand is that there is a presumption that that parents both parents should spend time with um, with children and the the act doesn't mention the primacy of one parent over the other it doesn't say mother or father <clears throat> its base rock its foundation is parent and parental responsibility and those are gender neutral so when we approach this we're not saying that there is any kind of fixed um, standard arrangement what we're saying is that in the circumstances we need to consider um, what the needs of the children are essentially as judged by the, any particular facets they may have, whether that be um, physical, mental or other um, um, features that a particular child, child has, their age, their understanding of the situation, their wishes and feelings and so forth. And we see that in the context of each parent's ability to meet those needs and how those needs can be um, resolved, practically speaking. So there's no hard and fast rules. There's no in, in other jurisdictions, I know that there are certain assumptions about age and children and, you know, at a certain age, a child will spend time with their father or, or their mother or whatever it may be. In English law, that's not the case. And so it's a very flexible, fluid um, system, which encourages, I think, parents to try and avoid using litigation if possible. But if they do, then the child is placed very much um, centrally and it's not my right as a parent to see my children it's my my children's right to benefit from seeing me all things being equal um, and there are limitations on that if one person ha if one parent has a, a particular vice shall we say uh, or has behaved in a way which will impact directly on the children or on um, the other parent then that can be relevant and it can be used to curtail the arrangements so it's it's fluid. There's no hard and fast rules, which is, I think most family, English family lawyers will say discretion is our, 
you know, um, vice and our virtue of our legal system as it relates to family law, it allows bespoke, uh, bespoke arrangements, but equally, you know, there's no hard and fast rules or, uh, or answers. So against that backdrop, how do we deal with these questions? If you were to come to me, what would, what would I say to you? Um, well, I'd say, well, if you want an English lawyer to deal with um, uh, uh, an application or an issue relating to children, the children essentially have to be habitually resident in this country, generally speaking. There are some very limited exceptions to the general rule that children have to be habitually resident in this country, um, but they're very, very specific. Um, and for the most part, um, they're not relevant, but they center on whether or not there's a divorce um, pending in the in this country and if there is then there's a limited jurisdiction but this is all legal stuff um for the most part um what we we do is try to avoid go going to court unless it's absolutely necessary because going to court is a highly um well in england it's very adversarial um and my experience certainly of dealing with children cases is it can become very polarized and it become it can become almost um more to do with the the parents sense of right and wrong than it is to do with the, the, the benefits of um, an outcome for a child, particularly when we get into filing statements and so forth. So believe it or not, we do try and avoid going to court. Um, and we do that by encouraging mediation, um, by encouraging uh, other less adversarial um, forms of dispute resolution, because that's what going to court is. It's a, me it's a method when two people cannot agree on an outcome uh, of getting a third person, a judge, to essentially impose their views of what's appropriate in the circumstances. And oftentimes, guess what? They disagree with what you may think. And so um, <clears throat> going to court's not a pan panacea. It's, it's, it's uh, an option of last resort. Um, but there are most definitely cases in which it's necessary because of the circumstances and the, um, the lack of... Um, flexibility in the approaches which two people are taking to the child arrangements but very much I would see it as something which um, we do when other things have been tried and failed so a flexible um, child-centered um, system which hopefully puts the child first on a very good day and presumably, Jim, obviously, habitual residence is key in, in the English courts. Habitual, habitual residence is the absolute, um, it's, it's the starting and it's, it's the, you know, the, the starting and the finishing point in some cases, because if a child isn't habitually resident in this country, the, the first question that's going to be asked is, well, why on earth are you dealing with uh, an issue in the English courts when the child is living and has been living um, in, for example, I think Jim's um, connection may well have frozen. So I'm going to move on to Christopher. Um, Christopher, if we can talk about children issues in Spain um, mm. and <clears throat> what the what the basis is for the Spanish courts to actually deal with child arrangements. Of course. I mean, before, good morning. Um, as I was kindly introduced, I'm Christopher Lee um, and I've enjoyed working with Mackerel on a number of cases. Um, but uh, I have my own firm and it's in Spain and uh, just before he froze um, Jim was saying um, about habitual residence being important and I think for all the things we're going to talk about this morning children is probably the issue in which there's most similarity between Spain which in many ways is an extremely different place in which to divorce or deal with family issues and England and Wales or indeed the UK. Um, for example uh, in the question of habitual residence we too the courts here as well will not want to deal with questions concerning children um, unless the children are resident in this country uh, and therefore we have a number of cases and I've got some going on at the moment where we are divorcing a couple uh, and we're dealing with the splitting of their assets and we're dealing with spousal maintenance but the courts here are not going to deal with their children and they're not going to deal with child maintenance and why is that purely because the children don't live here uh, in one particular case i've got at the moment they're living in england so 
uh, that adds a layer of, ex layer of expense. It won't be the same court in that instance being able to deal with everything. The children will be dealt in, with in England and everything else is going to be dealt with in Spain. Um, other similarities. It's the best interests of the child that are going to rule uh, on any decision about children, we hope, uh, in the Spanish court where there's dispute. And that's a similar position in England. How can the best interest of the child be determined? Well, in Spanish court proceedings, uh, if the child is 12 or over, um, then um, their view can be taken into account. It's not necessarily determinative, but they will be listened to. Uh, under 12, it's too young. They won't be, they won't, their, their views won't be canvassed. Um, so that's one thing. How do you find out what their view is? In England, whereas I'm sure Jim will say it's Kafkas. Um, so those are trained people who are able to talk with children on a, on a, on a, on a child-friendly and an age-appropriate uh, way about, about what their wishes are. Here, we have social services uh, and we also have uh, people who are similarly child psychologists who are linked to the courts and the courts may well uh, ask that they uh, speak to the children and then report back to the court. I've just got a coffee, that's very nice, thank you very much. Uh, I then report back to the court on what the child says. But unusually, and I think this won't happen in England, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but uh, uh, here the judge herself or himself will speak uh, to a child. So it's a bit like Emma Thompson in the Children Act. Um, that, not uh, often, not often is the answer. Not often, but it can sometimes, be. Sometimes, sometimes. can be done if it's in the movie. Yeah. Well, here it can be done more often than that. And the judge, uh, no wigs, of course, here, whatever the case, no wigs, and no wigs in family uh, proceedings for barristers or judges in the UK either. But um, here, no wigs at all anywhere in courts because it just doesn't happen like that. They had togas, which are the, the sort of robes which the lawyers will wear, but they won't wear them in children's proceedings. And if the judge is going to speak, speak to a child, the judge will speak to the child uh, without lawyers being present, perhaps an interpreter if that child doesn't speak Spanish. Um, and then, um, uh, 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 as well as perhaps the um, child psychologist linked to the court. So there may be the judge plus child psychologist speaking to the child, I mean, not at the same time. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a figure in Spanish litigation in relation to children in court cases, uh, whether it's agreed, whether the parties agree everything in relation to their children, or they don't agree. So there's gonna be some sort of fight in the court. Um, there is a figure called the public prosecutor. In Spanish, it's fiscal. Uh, sounds a bit weird to say the public prosecutor will be involved if there is a children's case. We're not talking about delinquent children. We're talking about normal children, where they're going to live, who's going to pay the money, who are they going to see, where they're going to go to school, uh, what religion they're going to take. Uh, there is this public prosecutor figure. And that is simply because traditionally that's what happens in Spain. And every time there is a children's element to a family law case, the public prosecutor will be consulted as to their view about what the judge should order in relation to the children. The judge won't always follow the public prosecutor's uh, guidance, but very often will. Uh, and, uh, and so even if we have a totally agreed divorce involving children, that means there will be no court hearing. We can do that in Spain. The parties sign an agreement they then uh, re-sign before the court in the court office, so it's not a court hearing. If they have children, and so within that agreement, there are things about where the children live, who they will see, who is going to pay what in relation to their upkeep, what school they're going to go to, who will pay the fees, if there are fees. That agreement will be looked at by the public prosecutor. And, uh, and um, if we've written it, it it'll, be, it'll be approved because we won't say anything in there that the public prosecutor wouldn't like and would object to. But as an example, in Spain, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, a judge will expect both parents to contribute financially to their children. So even if one of the parents, even if she's the earner and he earns nothing, uh, or he's got some illness and it's extremely difficult for that person, that, the father to earn, he will be expected to pay some sort of token amount for the child. It may be a hundred euros a month, probably wouldn't be less than that. In other words, 
the court here will always take it that the that a, that a parent must make effort in some way to contribute to their child's upkeep. Um, before I close this section, uh, let me talk about child abductions. It's something we do a lot of in this office. I enjoy it very much, if, one can, if that's the right verb. Um, and child abductions are very prevalent, particularly in this country. Let me sip a bit of coffee. Probably because it's very sunny here. People come on holiday here. They know Spain, particularly in the south of Spain. There are a lot of expats. People can blend in. Many abductions are cases where children, well, no, not many. Rarely they are, where children are taken and hidden. And so Spain is quite a good place to do that if there's loads of expats living around your area. As I say, usually towards the south of Spain, but not always. And lots of child abductions don't have any hiding element at all, and the other parent knows where they are. But in any event, child abductions in Spain are dealt with in a very different way than in England and or Scotland or Northern Ireland. And they are generally dealt with uh, certainly not as adeptly by the authorities here or the courts. And the simple reason is two reasons. One is the courts are not centralised. Any child abducted into England and Wales or to Scotland or Northern Ireland, there will only be a very limited number of judges who will look at the case so they know exactly what they're doing and they don't make mistakes on the law. Here, the courts are not, as I say, centralised enough and so often mistakes are being made, unfortunately, and, uh, and, 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 and in terms of law, the wrong decision is being coming, come to. And the second reason um, is that the central authority in relation to child abductions, all countries that have signed the 1980 Hague Convention uh, authorise the central authority to, um, to handle uh, many of those cases if they're not being dealt with on a private basis. And the central authority here is very um, uh, overworked, underfunded and uh, inept basically. So there's a very, very different panorama uh, in relation to children when it comes to them being taken or kept in one country uh, from their country of home against the wishes of the other parent. But that's a whole nother story and I probably shouldn't go into that now. Uh, so that's probably what I'm going to say on children and it's back to Alison or possibly Jim straight away, I don't know. Thanks Christopher, can we move to the next slide please? So I'm going to talk very briefly about the divorce procedure in England and Wales because I'm sure that most of the people watching will know how that works currently. Um, obviously there is going to be a change at some point in the not too distant future. There's now legislation on the statute book for no fault divorce um, and we'll, we're just waiting to see exactly when that's going to be brought in. So I'm going to stick with the way the divorce law is currently. Um, it's governed under the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973 and a party can petition for divorce on the basis that the marriage is irretrievably broken down. However, this has to be evidenced by one of five factors. Those factors are adultery of the other party, their unreasonable behaviour, uh, desertion, the parties having been separated for two years and both consenting to a divorce being granted, and also the parties having been separated for five years. So you issue a divorce petition on the basis of irretrievable breakdown, evidenced by one of those five factors. And you can only do that if you're domiciled in England and Wales, or if you meet one of the habitual residence tests. The procedure is, paper-based um, and very commonly it's the case that before proceedings are issued the parties either directly or through their solicitors will have a conversation and agree on what basis the divorce is going to proceed. If they can reach an agreement then obviously that avoids the expensive and somewhat time-consuming process of a defended divorce. So the divorce petition is lodged at the court for issue along with a marriage certificate and a fee of £550 is paid. This can be done to one of the central divorce issuing centres or alternatively we now have an online procedure. Once the proceedings are issued, the court normally sends them to the respondent by post. Um, on a practical note, I would suggest that if your respondent is overseas, then you look at having the papers back to you and arranging personal service because 
quite frequently, it can be very important to prove that the respondent has been properly served. Once the papers have been served, if the respondent is in England and Wales, then they have seven days in which to acknowledge service on the standard form. Um, if they're based overseas, then there's an extended period of 22 days. The acknowledgement of services returned to the court, commonly as professional courtesy, you would send a copy to the other side. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then you will be notified by the court that the acknowledgement of service has been completed and a copy will be sent to you. You can then use that document in order to assist in the completion of the statement in support of the application for the decree NISI. So the decree NISI is the first step in the two-stage dissolution process. Once you complete the statement, send the application back to the court. The court will then list a date for the decree NISI to be pronounced. Obviously, the court will notify you of that date. And whilst you can attend and sit in open court when the decrees are actually read out, there isn't any requirement to do so. And very frequently, well, pretty much all the time, no one attends to listen to that. The decree NISI doesn't actually dissolve the marriage. The dissolution only occurs when the decree absolute is applied for and the petitioner can apply for the decree absolute, the earliest opportunity being six weeks and one day after the decree NISI has been pronounced. So in terms of jurisdiction, which is obviously what most of us are concerned about when we're looking at international issues, before Brexit, if you had a choice of jurisdiction in which to commence divorce proceedings and the other possible jurisdiction was European, then the party who issued first in that particular country would secure jurisdiction. So ordinarily there was a great deal of consideration with clients as to what the most appropriate jurisdiction would be, what would secure the best outcome for them, and then it was a race to issue in that country. So this was known then as first past the post system. However, since the 1st of January this year, that rule no longer applies. And whilst of course there is consideration as to the best jurisdiction, and you can still look at what the outcome would be, the seizing of the opportunity, so the first past the post, the race isn't quite the same as it was. So the rules which apply now are the same rules as any other country in the world. And that's known legally as the forums convenience test, which so where is the appropriate forum for the divorce to take place? Again, the first party to issue will seize jurisdiction in that particular country, but it can be challenged and it can be challenged as to whether or not that country is the most appropriate given all the circumstances of the parties and where their assets are located. So if we move on to the next slide, I think Christopher's going to explain to us in Spain um, exactly what the divorce procedure is and how it differs significantly. I think you're on mute, Christopher. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> ah, right. Basics. So, yes, divorce procedure in Spain. Um, again, uh, or perhaps more so, there are other elements here that aren't so familiar as people, hopefully many people in or Henry VIII aren't very familiar with divorce in England and Wales either. But um, here, for, for example, Jim or Alison can go into court and say, Your Honour, if that's what you say in England, um, I am whoever I am and I represent whoever I represent and that's fine. In Spain, just to get past that initial uh, issue, we can't say who we represent, we have to prove it and we have to prove it with the power of attorney. So many of our clients are not even in Spain. Uh, if they're in Spain, this is easier to do. They can either go before a Spanish notary and sign a power for litigation purposes, which allows us to act for them. Um, or, um, in fact, if they're in Spain, we can wait until the court asks them to confirm that we act for them, and then they can be taken into the court office and they can sign there. So that's really easy. Many of our clients aren't in Spain. They could be all over the world. So imagine they're in England. Well, we have to send them to a local notary um, 
uh, in England or, or the notary has to go to them or possibly over Zoom, they have to be seen by a notary uh, in this day and age. Um, and we produce in English uh, a power of attorney, the same power of attorney, but in English, uh, which we will then subsequently have translated into Spanish so the court knows what it says. And it will indeed appoint us and it will appoint court agents who are called procuradores and court agents are um, necessary in almost all legal procedures in Spain. They are, are, are uh, although they're billed in a power of attorney along with us as mere lawyers, um, their importance is different. Uh, they're important, but not in the same way. They don't write petitions. They don't speak in court. What they are is really glorified post people. And uh, a, a litigation cannot be run in Spain unless they interface and move documents between the court and the lawyers, from the lawyers to the court. And in this day and age, uh, the only time our fax machines in the office were and make noises is because court agents are using them. A few court agents still use fax machines, but even though uh, the majority now don't and the courts are digitalized, um, the court won't send us as lawyers or any lawyers in Spain, any paperwork, any pleadings. They will always uh, email them on to the court agent who's appointed under the power of attorney for a particular case who will then send them to us. And that's the same in reverse. When we have a petition or a, an appeal or whatever to file in court, we have to send it to the court agent who will then put it into court. Um, issuing petitions. We can't issue petitions quite as quickly as you can in England. That can be very, very, uh, it's not because we're slow. Uh, it's not because of a manana attitude. It is simply because uh, in, in England, a divorce petition is basically a tick box affair. And particularly when it comes to finance, uh, you tick the box that you want financial relief for children or for spousal maintenance or for assets or whatever. Uh, and, and the detail comes later. In a Spanish petition, it's not tick box. We have to have a petition written and we have to get everything in there at the beginning. And it's a script which is very difficult to depart from once it's been written. So it takes more time to produce. Also, because the nature of my firm's work and my work tends to be international, there's a lot of languages involved, most usually English as well as Spanish. And, uh, and uh, we therefore to go to court have to have court approved translations. We have our own translators who are court certified to do that work and to work with us in house. And we have to put in uh, when we do a petition, for example, if the couple married in Bradford, we have to put in a copy of their uh, marriage certificate, which has been stamped at the Foreign Office in the UK to show it's authentic. That's called apple stealing. And then we have to translate that into Spanish. So there are translations. There may be an employment agreement we've got to translate, or there may be, I don't know, a prenuptial agreement that was signed in England that we have to translate into Spanish because a party is going to rely on it or seek to rely on it. Um, so, as I say, not so quick. In one way, our petitions will be quicker though, and that's something where England will join us in the not too distant future. I think Alison told me it might be at the end of this year, but don't hold your breath. And that is because we don't have to faff around about saying how badly someone's behaved. Or we don't have to try and work out whether they've been separated for two years and there's consent, or for five years without consent. Because here, thank goodness, there is no fault divorce by which I mean we don't have to allege any fault. It doesn't matter. No one can object to being divorced, except if they haven't been married for three months. So as long as they've been married for three months, there is a right to divorce in Spain. And we don't have to be all uh, taken up with, uh, with, with misbehavior. That's jolly good, I think. Um, so, um, the divorce basically runs like, if it's an agreed divorce, it's an agreement we sign, I think I said earlier, well, we sign, the client sign, or both clients sign, uh, husband and wife, husband and husband, wife and wife, um, there will be no court hearing. I've said that before. Uh, in fact, something I haven't said before is that if there is agreement and there are no children involved, there's no court at all. There needs to be no court order in the sense that in Spain, and I think in France and some other countries, public notaries, can authorize a divorce. That's relatively new. Um, if 
the matter is contentious, I mean there is dispute, then uh, there is a petition if we are kicking off the divorce process, pro process in which we don't have to, as I say, allege any fault. We set out the history very briefly of the, of the parties uh, when they met, when they married, they've now decided to divorce, whether they have children or not, and whether perhaps uh, uh, we, we are offering spousal maintenance, our client is offering to pay the spouse maintenance, or perhaps both parties have their own income sources and there is no need for that, and there are no children, it's basically simple. Um, imagine if we don't offer spousal maintenance. Well, when that uh, petition is served on the other side, and uh, that is only going to happen uh, in accordance with Spanish rules, if it's the Spanish court serving, so notifying. The parties can't validly send the divorce petition to, the, to their spouse, um, nor can the solicitors ask for one party, send it to solicitors for the other party or to the other party direct. None of that will be seen as valid in Spain. It has to be the court itself serving, which it will do usually by recorded delivery post. Um, it may, if the other party is abroad, the court might seek to engage with them with an email address because it hasn't been able to get a confirmation of delivery back from the post office in Sydney, Australia. It's got lost. So if there's an email address, they may then invite the other party to engage with them. That's the court uh, to arrange for the court to deliver them the documents. The importance about it being a valid service or notification of paperwork is that it's only then when the time clock starts ticking. And once a party has received a divorce petition in the post, the husband gets it, she's divorcing him. He has, this is a Spanish petition of course, he has 30, 20 working days, which is about 30 calendar days, depending on the month, 20 working days um, to file a defense. Otherwise, it won't be to file a defence and also importantly to file a counterclaim. So if she is divorcing and she earns more money than he does and he's been looking after the kids and she doesn't offer any spousal maintenance, the way he can get that claimant is in a counterclaim, which he must file within 20 working days of the petition being notified to him. Um, and uh, if there is a counterclaim, then the other party has a uh, certain number of days in which to respond in writing to that. Uh, that all being done, um, basically it moves to the court then um, specifying a hearing date. We act in courts all over Spain. They are all slow. Some of them are much, much slower than others. Some of them are surprisingly relatively speedy, uh, but still slow. Um, some of them excruciatingly slow and inadequate. Um, we can't really control that, we can monitor it, but we can't really do anything more than that. Um, so when the court hearing actually happens, even though the whole process may be excruciatingly slow, the court hearing itself will be amazingly fast, in the sense that, uh, in my experience, it won't last more than three, four hours at the outside. Partly that's because the judge will be going to lunch, or there will be a late lunch in Spain, uh, and the judge doesn't come back after lunch. There are no two or three or four or two week, three or four days, two week court hearings, not in Spain. So in a number of cases, they are complex. And when we have the possibility of perhaps Mackerel divorcing our client in England and we divorcing them in Spain, there's all sorts of dynamics about what might be better for a client, one jurisdiction or the other. Um, but in a very, very complex case, if it's very key from our client's point of view that the complexities of free finance, for example, be thoroughly looked into, then uh, Spain is not the good choice because there won't be much time devoted to doing that. There's a short attention span with Spanish judges and they don't understand anything like trusts. Why? Not because they're silly, but because trusts don't exist in this jurisdiction. Um, so that is probably all I'm going to say for the time being. And I'm handing back, I think, to Jim or possibly to Alison or both. Thanks, Christopher. Can we move to 
next slide, please. Welcome back, Jim, as well. I know he's having some technical issues. This <coughs> yeah. Um, so again, we're going to move on to financial settlement. We're going to capture Jim's knowledge before he drops off again. So Jim, can you share with us maybe just how financial settlements are looked at under the law in England and Wales? Okay, yeah. Um, first off, I am having some difficulties, so I'll try and make this um, quick but thorough. Uh, so, um, what are we doing in this country in terms of um, financial arrangements? Well, again, subject to certain assumptions that um, uh, when you um, when your relationship ends, um, and assuming, of course, that you're married, because the position is very different if you're unmarried, uh, and that you've filed a divorce petition, then certain options are available to you. Uh, going to court requires you to have a divorce petition already issued and the financial arrangements are what's deemed ancillary or slightly separate to the, the main uh, issue before the court, which is ending the marriage. So we have a discretionary redistributive system, which has as an objective um, uh, a fair arrangement between two people in which there is no discrimination between the parties in terms of uh, what they brought to the marriage in the sense of, or what they did during the course of the marriage in the sense of um, arrangements whereby one person stays at home, um, raises children perhaps, gives up a career, while the other uh, works, uh, earns money, contributes to a pension and so forth. If that uh, marriage comes to an end, both are deemed to have made an equal contribution. And on that basis, fairness is then determined with reference to needs, compensation and sharing. So the law set out in the Matrimonial Causes Act, Section 25 and related sections, gives a comprehensive uh, list of criteria and powers and ranges of orders which the courts are able to make in relation to divorcing couples. The, I think the powers are worth, the, the types of orders are worth um, considering. Um, they can range from short-term maintenance payments, which are, is financial support from one spouse to another, to sharing pension funds, which are not in the name of the spouse, uh, by way of a pension sharing order, or more unusually, a pension attachment order. Um, transfers of property between spouses, lump sum payments, and frankly, most anything uh, in between, regardless of the um, jurisdiction in which the assets are held. So the, the courts have very broad powers and um, the discretion which they have to exercise is notorious for its unpredictability which again sounds familiar doesn't it to the sounds much like the the approach that we take in terms of uh child arrangements so flexible uh bespoke discretionary uh aka uncertain um and potentially uh two positions or two settlement options which uh, both spouses are putting forward could be <clears throat> could be perfectly um acceptable and could happen but could be quite different in their uh, detail and their quantum. And so um, it's, it's a difficult thing sometimes to, to resolve, frankly. Um, the, the one thing I think which you can say with, with, some, um, with some force is that whatever the, the situation that we're dealing with, um, whether we're dealing with a lot of money or not so much money, um, the priority is given to meeting the needs of the parties and priority within that framework is given to the party with whom any um, children under the age of 18 will continue to live. So they take the, the first slice of the pie, so to speak. Um, and then it's a question of, well, what's, what remains and how can that be distributed fairly, meeting the needs of the other party. And if there is a surplus and more often than not, there isn't, um, then sharing that equally, all things um, you know, being considered uh, <clears throat> the same. Um, so we have a, a system which aims to meet your reasonable needs. That's its priority. Um, and if we can't reach an agreement, um, or if two people can't reach an agreement, 
um, following financial disclosure, which uh, is something which can be very extensive in this country, um, then there may be a uh, problem. So how do we resolve those issues? Broadly speaking, quite similar to the way in which you would um, resolve a, a children um, issue. Um, so this is the full raft of options uh, from discussions between parties, uh, the involvement of solicitors to advise and negotiate and um, reflect on particular pieces of information, um, mediators to facilitate the parties in reaching an agreement between themselves, and then the obvious, um, if, we, if none, of the, none of the above work, well, let's go to court. Um, going to court is, <clears throat> it's a difficult process, and I say that um, having completed two final hearings in the last, what, two months, essentially, um, no one in their right mind would want to go the whole course through the three stages of a, of a financial remedy hearing. It's long, drawn out, and very expensive and stressful. I think one of the, the things that lawyers and, and parties and courts certainly focus on in this country is what we call financial disclosure, <clears throat> which is legalese for tell me how much money you've got um, and show me where your resources and assets are and what's the value of everything and anything which um, you or your spouse may have. And a huge amount of time and effort is spent in the process of obtaining, scrutinizing, and um, asking for more um, uh, financial information, updating the information that you've already had, and so on and so forth. We don't have a system where the, the key date is fixed at the date of separation. The key date um, is really the date that you're either negotiating at or if you are going to court, the, the date of the final hearing. So we can then have subsidiary arguments about the increase in value and so on and so forth. And there are all manner of clever arguments which <clears throat> the courts and lawyers have developed over the years <clears throat> to nuance this. But the fundamental is that we have a system which requires openness in terms of the two parties' respective financial positions. Um, one in which there's a, a broad um, range of orders available to the courts uh, where needs come first. And that's the case even if you have something um, which I know uh, is probably much more prevalent in um, Spain than in this country, uh, a prenuptial agreement. While prenuptial agreements are becoming much more relevant and uh, in some cases, if they're properly drafted and they're properly uh, advised on and people understand what they're entering into and they therefore are deemed to be fair and they meet people's needs, then yes, they can be uh, a, a very significant um, thing, but they must meet your needs. They can't simply <clears throat> blag it, so to speak. Um, a prenuptial agreement that doesn't meet needs is one that's not really going to hold much water in our country anyway. Um, and against all of that, um, and I think for those reasons, um, the courts in this country have developed a reputation for being extremely generous. And I think with certainly when you, when I, as a, a, an English family lawyer, hear the approach of other countries to uh, financial settlement, my eyebrows uh, go vertical and I frankly can't believe what I'm hearing. Uh, and that goes even for some jurisdictions which are closer to home, like for example, the approach in Scotland. So I think we have this sort of, uh, <laughs> if you wanna get divorced, come to this country. Uh, and certainly I think there are very good reasons for doing so. If for example, you have a substantial pension, um, if uh, you are resident abroad <clears throat> in a country which may not be able to make pension sharing orders, or if it does, it may make them according to a particular predetermined formula. Um, you may be much better off coming to this country if that's at all possible. And, and it is, uh, <clears throat> it is a, a situation where you can't simply land in London on a Monday, file for a divorce on a Tuesday, and uh, ask for a pension sharing order on a Wednesday. There are the jurisdictional hurdles which Alison has mentioned. But fundamentally, um, our jurisdiction, I think, has developed rightly um, the reputation for being extremely generous. And, and certainly, I think pensions are one area where um, we are much more able to 
take a needs-based approach than in other countries. So again, if you're younger, if you're in your 30s or maybe early 40s and you have a hopefully a long and successful career ahead of you where you can contribute to a pension, it may be less of an issue. But equally, if you're at the um, grayer end of the spectrum, it may be that England is a, is a, is a better place to divorce. So horses for courses, discretionary um, and unpredictable, but with many advantages in terms of the types of orders and the quantum of the order, uh, the value of the settlement that you'll, re that you'll get. Okay, Jim, thanks very much. Glad that the um, technology stood up. Um, Christopher, uh, in relation to Spain, I am imagining it's completely different. Mm, it is, Alison, yes. Um, well, I mean, Jim's eyebrows might go up vertically. My eyebrows probably spin like a spinning bow tie on the <laughs> when I see the financial settlements that are available in England and Wales, we are a much meaner jurisdiction. Uh, we are not what's called a big money jurisdiction. So the rule of thumb is if there is a very wealthy, a much wealthier party in a divorce than the spouse, earns a lot more, has more assets, if there is a choice, that's a big key. If there really is a genuine choice, mm -hmm. they, if they are allowed to divorce in both jurisdictions, which is probably going to be based largely on their residence or the residence of one of them, or on their joint or single domicile in <laughs> England, or on their joint nationality, if we're talking about Spain. If there is really a choice of jurisdiction, then the wealthier spouse will be better off divorcing in mean Spain and the poorer spouse will be definitely better off getting divorced, financially speaking, in England. Uh, Prenuptial agreements, Jim mentioned those. We, yes, there may be more in Spain, but not in the sense I think that, that English lawyers or lawyers operating in England will think uh, of prenuptial agreements. What there are more of in Spain is not an agreement which sets out what, who will, be paid what on divorce. It's simply an agreement which changes what's called the matrimonial regime. Matrimonial regimes don't exist in the UK. They exist in Spain and other um, civil law jurisdictions like Spain. And in we have 17 semi-autonomous regions which make up Spain. And two very importantly of those have a regime called separation of assets, which looks a bit more, is results, uh, uh, it's a bit more like England's. Um, and that's Catalonia, where I happen to be sitting now. Barcelona is the, the capital city of Catalonia as a region, and, uh, uh, and the Balearic Islands, Mallorca, Menorca, etc. Those are separation. In the rest of Spain, it's generally um, shared property, which means that after marriage, anything earned by one party, which is put into their name solely, or an asset after marriage bought, by one party put into their sole name is going to be treated as being owned by the other spouse as to 50%. And the sort of prenuptial agreements that we may see there are those people getting married in a, in a region of Spain where there is shared property may choose, particularly if one is wealthier than the other, they may choose before marriage to go before a notary and to switch and agree that their matrimonial regime will be one of separation. So there won't be that deemed sharing. Uh, because it's not a big money jurisdiction, we don't see so many prenuptial agreements in the English sense of setting out all the financial assets and income of the parties and what will happen if they've been married for five years, how much will they will get, what will the spouse get if they've been married for 10 years. We don't see so much of that, but where we do see it might be where the couple is, couple is very international and there may be a whole range of interlinking prenups and maybe one of the parties is Spanish, which could mean possibly that they come and live in Spain in the future and they end up divorcing here. So there will be a Spanish prenup. And the interesting thing there is prenuptial agreements in Spain are binding. As Jim has said, in, in England and Wales, they could be, huh? or otherwise they may be persuasive. But here they are binding as long as they are signed properly. And one of the first things about signing a prenup agreement here, surprise, surprise, is they have to be signed before a public notary. Uh, public notaries are very useful people in Spain and most things formally have to happen before then. Um, a very big difference here, let me just say, applicable law. England and Wales applies English law because it's the best law. 
Scotland applies Scottish straight UK law as well, it, it's the best law uh, from their point of view. Here in Spain, we will apply other countries' laws, not if we just want to, but if we have to. Um, that won't happen in the UK and it can produce some surprising results. So in a number of divorces in, in, with international aspects, we will be applying different countries' laws and it may be two different countries' laws or it may be three. Uh, for children, it'll always be Spanish law. So children living in Spain, it's always going to be Spanish law with an overlay perhaps of local law to the extent that makes any difference for the children's case. Um, uh, for spousal maintenance, it's going to be uh, basically driven by the law of the place where the, the person who's seeking the, to make the claim is. So if they were living in England uh, and they were making a claim for spousal maintenance within the context of a Spanish divorce, it could well be English law on maintenance that we would apply. Um, the divorce itself, the dissolution of the marriage, will be linked to habitual residence. That may not be Spanish law. If both parties are Spanish and they're based in London, they can divorce in Spain because they're both Spanish nationals. But because they're both based in London, the law to apply to the dissolution of their marriage in accordance with Spanish rules will be English law, which is a bit weird because under English law to dissolve a marriage, you must show, as we said before, reason, misbehavior or separation. So there'll be a whole question there about whether we have to import that to Spain and ask a Spanish court, which isn't used to looking at fault in a divorce, suddenly to consider it. Asset division is the big one, could be the big one. There, if the marriage has taken place before um, February 2019, then it'll be the, the law of the joint nationality of the parties, which will govern it. So if they're both... Uh, Northern Irish, it'll be the law of Northern Ireland when we come to splitting the assets in a Spanish court where it's disputed. If uh, they don't share a common nationality, so one is Spanish and one is Northern Irish, they don't share a common nationality, it will be the law that they've chosen in a prenuptial agreement. But if there isn't one, and very often there isn't one, you move to the next test and it'll be the law where they lived, where they first lived after marriage. You ignore honeymoon. So if the Spanish person and uh, her Northern Irish husband uh, set up in uh, New York to work after marriage, it'll be the law of New York that has to apply. How does a Spanish nah, judge, I mean, goodness me, English judges only have to know about English law. Clever, clever Spanish judges have to know about New York law, Qatari law, if they lived in Qatar, Australian law, all sorts of laws. That's amazing, isn't it? Well, they, the only way they know, of course, is if they're told and they have to be told officially and appropriately. So in those cases, we have to then go to lawyers in Sydney, Australia, for example, or, or Qatar and get them to confirm in what's called a certificate of law what the law says there. And that's what we tell the Spanish judge they should be applying. Of course, the Spanish judge often doesn't apply a foreign law as uh, roundly as a judge whose law it is. So the results might not be the same if we're applying English law on asset division as they would be if an English judge was applying them. Not least because an English judge is used to big money and big figures and we're not. Lastly, let me just rush in and say, very big difference. Jim mentions pension sharing. Pension sharing orders don't exist in Spanish divorces. So that's a huge issue. As Jim says, if you're getting towards the end of the working life when there's a divorce, and if there is a huge pension pot belonging to one of the spouses only, that is a really difficult issue if the divorce is happening in Spain, because we may not be able to get at it for the poorer spouse. We may not be able to divide it effectively. Uh, that's probably all I've got time for in case we have some questions. Yep, we absolutely do. Just before I move on to the questions, there will be a poll popping up on the screen shortly. So if anybody wants to get in touch with any of us um, confidentially, then do complete the poll um, and then we'll come back to you. Um, and also at the end, you'll see our contact details anyway. So, but yeah, we have had um, a number of questions. So um, we've got time to deal with a couple. So firstly, maybe one for Jim. Um, well, actually, for both of you. So, is the court able to make decisions on discrete issues relating to my child when we as parents cannot agree? Um, an example is given in relation to um, schooling, but also vaccinations. They're very topical at the moment. Very much. Um, 
yes is the answer um we've we've had a vaccinations is one which has had a sort of long and colorful history in this country in terms of um child uh, proceedings um i don't know how long ago would it be 15 10 years something like that possibly more um, there was the whole uh, fury about MMR vaccinations and the apparent alleged not actually linked to um, autism. And that, that produced a spate of um, uh, cases. So um, I, I imagine that there's going to be a similar controversy potentially in relation to um, COVID injections and vaccinations. But I mean, if there is, then yes. If one party or one parent says yes and the other says no, well then yes, you can go to court and you can issue um, uh, an application for a um, specific issue order um, and the court will make a decision um, and most likely will say yes, the child should be um, vaccinated. Um, that tends to be the case, um, certainly with younger children. I think um, it would probably be the case if there were as an older child with I don't know, particular reasons, then it would possibly be much more complicated. But um, in terms of the outcome, I mean, it, it's very much fact dependent. In terms of the possibility of making an application, then very much, yes, that can be done. Okay, and presumably the court takes that decision on what's in the best interest of the child, taking into account the welfare checklist. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, there are very few applications in relation to children that they don't. Uh, although sometimes people think um, that they, they do. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's very much, uh, I think it's more in, in, a, in a vaccination type context, it's very much more, um, dare I say, paternalistic um, in, in approach uh, rather than uh, looking at the, the nuances of the arrangements for this particular child. Um, I mean, in terms of other specific issues which we do deal with, schooling's one, um, religious upbringings another, uh, there's a whole raft of them. I mean, literally anything you can almost think of potentially could be the subject of an application like this. Okay. Um, and Christopher, in, in terms of Spanish law, if these sorts of issues arise, so if parents separated can't agree whether the child should be vaccinated, how does the Spanish law look at it? Well, the first thing to say here, we don't know, unfortunately, because this question isn't clarifying whether where their children are living, because that would be the very important thing, because it may be interesting to compare. But if the children are resident in England and Wales, it'll be Jim's answer and Jim's application. If they're actually living in Vigo in Spain or wherever in Spain, then it's going to be the Spanish court, if at all, if at all because unfortunately, the Spanish court will be very slow. So I would be, it would be... Uh, <clears throat> emergency decision we want have to decide whether to vaccinate this child in the next month or we have to decide whether this child's going to start in september and we're talking about july it's hopeless there won't be a court decision mm. no way so that's the that's the message here um children dealt with yes in long term in rounded terms in maybe less specific terms about their future in the context of a separation of parents married or unmarried uh, yes, but but not. And we've got a, a specific issue here, and we're going to expect the courts to jump on it. Um, they are very slow. If we're not talking about criminal matters, you know, it is very slow. Even if we're talking about, as I mentioned before, child abduction, the courts here in Spain do not comply with the international norms. And any application, I think, will take. Uh, uh, I mean, we have one at the moment where a um, a child's one of the parents of the child has died and uh, in Spain and the child is here alone and the child's other biological parent is in a different country and wishes to take this child with them and this child doesn't want to go with that parent. This child prefers to go to another family member who we're acting for in a different country. Um, and uh, you know, we are not getting a decision. This child <laughs> needs a decision very quickly. The child is now in a children's home in Spain yes. uh, and desperately wants to leave there. Um, but, uh, you know, we can't engage the court. We have engaged the court, but the court isn't responding in the way one would hope uh, they would do. I think in England, if there is an emergency case in relation to a child, mm. a judge will be taken out of bed at night to, to make the order. That will not happen here. OK. All right. Thank you. Mm. Um, I'm mindful of the time, but just to touch on one other question, which I think is interesting. Um, I am English, but working in Spain for the next six months, 
where can I start divorce proceedings? Now, clearly, obviously, being English, temporary contract in Spain, I would say the person it, we would as domicile in England and Wales, so we could certainly commence the process here. Would they be able to commence it in Spain, Christopher? Well, it's interesting. This 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 person inquiring and saying. Um, can I commence it? You know, if they're the actor, if they're the petitioner in this process, they can't until they've been resident here for six months okay. uh, or more. That's on the basis that the other spouse isn't here, okay? Mm -hmm. So they'd have to be resident here for six months or more, and we will have to demonstrate to the court they have been resident. So really we're looking for um, an early in that six month period an early uh, confirmation that they've filed as as residents they've inscribed themselves at the town hall as residents plus perhaps a rental agreement showing that they're renting and living here and their work contract showing the day they start in spain but it's going to they have to wait six months uh different if their spouse is already here um because um because then there wouldn't be that if the spouse is already habitually resident and they've moved over they were working in england but they're now joining their spouse in madrid who's been in madrid all the time and they're going to be in madrid for about six months they don't have to wait for six months okay so it's, it's all to do with whether you are the whether you are the uh, uh whether the other spouse is here or not if the other spouse isn't here and they're coming for six months they won't be able to do it until they've been here for six months but back in england the spouse they've left behind would be able to divorce them. So if the poorer spouse has been left behind in England, there would be a risk then that that poorer spouse, if they've got wind of a divorce situation, will file in England, um, uh, sorry, big pardon, will file in Spain uh, because they, 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 they don't have to wait for their, for their other partner to, to have been here for six months. Interesting, interesting. Okay, well, as I say, I am mindful of the time. We have run over a little bit. So um, I'm going to draw it to a conclusion. We have had many questions. So if you want to follow up those questions, anybody that's watching, um, do email us and we'll come back to you on a one-to-one on -a -one basis. So um, thank you hugely to Christopher for taking the time out and joining us today. I'm sure you'll agree. It's very, very interesting, the differences in a country which is so close to us and also one that we have very close links to. So thank you, Christopher, for today. Um, thank you also to Jim and um, he got through it despite the technical difficulties. So thank you for that. Um, you'll see our contact details on the screen. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact us. And I look forward to seeing you all on, on the next occasion. Thanks very much. Cheerio. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <clears throat>